Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old podcast, we are talking about a legendary serial killer. But, but, but not like legendary in the legend, wait for it, dairy kind of way. More like in the, whoa, how is this piece of crap a, a human a human being? Oh wait, he's not. This walking, talking, killing turd's name be Gary. Gary Heidnick. A real despicable piece of shit. He actually might be one of the most uh, sadistic killers I've ever covered here on, on that chapter. And, and bearing in mind, I was talking about Tommy Lynn Sells, who enjoyed killing women and children not not too long ago. So, so yeah, uh, get your boots on. You know, he, he's, Gary Heidnick's not, not technically a serial killer, but he sure as shit was a monster. You know, you know Buffalo Bill from, from Silence of the Lambs? Well, you're about to learn about the real one. Before we get into it, if you wouldn't mind, please rating and reviewing the podcast. If, if you get a chance, that helps out a lot. Now, <gasps> deep breath. Well, I, I guess that depends on what you're, you're doing while listening to this. Let's give it a go. East of the Mississippi, along the shores of Lake Erie in Ole, Ohio, there's a town named East Lake. Whoa, must have taken them a long time to come up with that name. And on November 22nd, 1943, it became the birthplace of one Gary Michael Heidnick. Gary's parents, Michael and Ellen Heidnick, got divorced when he was just three years old. For the first four years after their parents split, Gary and his little brother Terry were raised by their mother before they were put in the care of their father and his new wife. Now this move was one of those good old cases of out of the frying pan into the fire for little old Gary. While his mother, you right, she had been, you know, violent, uh, violent in bursts, once beating him with a toy airplane for wetting his pants, not great. Gary's father was on a whole other poop level. The abuse from his father, it was pretty much, pretty much non-stop. Gary's father, Michael, he was not only a violent drunk, but he would also inflict regular psychological abuse. For obvious reasons, the re reasons being his parents were really, really shitty, Gary began wetting his bed from a very young age. And in response to this, his father took to taking Gary's stained bedsheets and hanging them out of his bedroom window in full view of his neighbors, simply... To, to shame him was in, hey everybody, look what Gary just did. Terry would also later tell an interviewer that their father would draw a bullseye on the seat of Gary's pants before they went to school, you know, hoping that the other students would kick him while walking down the school halls, which is a punishment that's just as ju juvenile as it is insane when it's your dad, the one doing it. Though Gary was undoubtedly bright and he was a capable student, his school life though was plagued by severe behavioral problems and, and emotional outbursts. He was teased by other students who referred to him as a football head. Oh my, football head? So that's where they got it from. Because of his oddly shaped head, which he and his brother Terry claimed was the result of a childhood accident, when Gary, Gaza over here, fell from a tree. Some have, you know, even speculated that this fall may have been one of the factors behind Gary's later extreme behavior. Now, that's something we've seen a couple of times. Um, the one that immediately comes to mind is Cosmo DiNardo, who, you know, he had some he had some issues, but it was when he, he was in an ATV accident and he fell off and he was like unconscious for a time. After that, people say, you know, that head, head injury just changed him. Now, young Gary, he was also unable to maintain eye contact. He was considered to be a shy, rather meek child. Gary, he would snap at classmates and teachers when they would just ask, you know, the most innocuous questions. And we you know when they just would try to involve him in class in school to be, you know, part of the football team, part of whatever sports they were playing, just part of the discussion in class, he would just, you know, fly off the handle. Unsurprisingly, Gary later dropped out of the public high school he attended before ninth grade aged 14, and, at his father's behest, attended Staunton Military Academy for two years, where he did, he did very well, but once again he left before graduation and returned to a regular public school 
for a short time. Finally, after leaving school yet again in 1961, aged 17, Gary enlisted in the army, where, after being graded as excellent five stars in basic training, he applied for several specialist positions, including military police, but was, once again, womp womp rejected. Eventually, he was sent to San Antonio to train as a medic, where, you know, once again, he did quite well. It seems that when Gary, you know, whenever he put his mind to something, he could be successful at it. And Gary seemed to have found a new start in the army, so much so that shortly after he transferred to the 46th Surgical Hospital in Landstuhl, West Germany, he finally earned his GED with a score of 96%. Perhaps for the first time ever, life was going well for Gary. This, this is the highlight of his life, ladies and gentlemen. Because that is until August of 1962. While stationed in Germany, Gary began to complain of migraines and dizziness, blurred vision and nausea. Gary would later claim that while he was stationed in Germany, doctors from the army gave him LSD and had him perform experiments. Now, there's no record of any such experiments, and it sounds kind of ridiculous at first, but then, you know, back in this day, the army, the CIA, they were later revealed to have experimented on their own troops and volunteers with, you know, various drugs, mind-controlled experiments. MK Ultra comes to mind, so, he, you know, some of this stuff could have actually happened to Gary. Whatever the case, anyway, which we will probably never know for, for sure, after seeing a neurologist at the hospital, Gary was diagnosed with gastroenteritis. The doctor also noticed that Gary displayed several clear and obvious signs of an unspecified mental illness, though he did prescribe an antipsychotic. Just over a month later, Gary was transferred back to the United States and was admitted to a military hospital in Philly, Philadelphia, for observation. While there, he was diagnosed with schizoid personality disorder, and that kind of tracks with, well, his history. You know, people with schizoid personality disorder, they usually show little to no interest in other people, ding, or forming relationships with others, double ding. This often can lead them to living secluded, even reclusive, or isolated lifestyles, pretty much withdrawing uh, from society, sometimes creating these extremely detailed and elaborate fantasy worlds that they would, would live in, giving them, you know, obviously as a source of comfort, but that would also then drive them even further away from being able to build real relationships. Now, it's important to note, though, that people with schizoid personality disorder, they don't usually have violent behavior or emotional outbursts. So, whatever, if he had this, whatever he was suffering from, you can't blame that for what he would later on, you know, do. And so, 14 months after he enlisted, due to his diagnosis, Gary was given an immediate honorable discharge from the army. In addition to this, he would also receive a full army pension. After leaving the army, Gary remained in Philadelphia and eventually somehow managed to parlay his medics training from the army into nursing classes, and he received an internship role as a licensed practical nurse at Philadelphia General Hospital. And so, tread the 70s, Gary, he worked various nursing jobs at a couple of different hospitals. One, he was fired from for poor attendance and frequent complaints about his rude behavior towards patients. And at one point, he'd also enroll at the University of Philadelphia, but dropped out after less than a month. As I said, Gary, he wasn't good at sticking to things, as you can see. But when he did stick to things, he was pretty, you know, he was a bright spark. He was pretty good. But un unfortunately, there was one thing Gary did stick at. He really shouldn't have. So with his income from the variety of nursing jobs he worked, and his full army uh, pension, he was doing pretty well financially, and he was actually able to purchase his first house. Other aspects of his life, though, were far, far more turbulent. Almost on a regular basis, Gary would try various ways to end his own life. He even went on to try every possible method you can think of to end your own life. He ate rat poison, 
he overdosed. He once um, tried to crash, like uh, die in a traffic accident uh, on his on his motorbike. One time he went to a doctor, only for the doctor to discover a piece of string tied so tightly around Gary's big toe that it was turning blue and throbbing. When the doctor asked Gary, uh, what, the, what the fuck is wrong with your toe? Gary revealed that he'd been hoping to induce gangrene in the limb, hoping that it would spread and kill him. Yeah, not very shocking that Gary would end up in another institution not uh, long afterwards, but I mean, I can re think of some ways Gary could have been real sure if he wanted to end his own life, but for some reason, he didn't. The 1970s, now, they brought about tragedy, a wedding, and Gary's first legal run-in that would eventually escalate into the vile crimes for which he would be remembered, so look forward to that. That decade began in, a, in an awful way for Gary when his mother, Ellen, was diagnosed with bone cancer and faced the prospect of a protracted painful death. And so she chose to end her own life before this with an overdose of medicine. Unfortunately for her, the medicine she chose wasn't one that would give you a peaceful or instant way out. Gary was 27 at the time of his mother's death. Now, also that you should remember, his mother was a horribly abusive... I mean, don't speak ill of the dead, but I mean, come on, she was a bitch, so... You know, I, I mean, I guess it still would have messed him up anyway. The following year was 1971. And Heidnick jumped into the world of organized religions. And he established. He became a kind of his own cult leader, um, for want of a better word. He established the United Church of the Ministers of God. With a mighty congregation of a whole five people. Now this was uh, not any kind of calling from a higher power. Now for Gary, this was a business move. Uh, and when I say business move, I really mean a scam. He invented his own religion to scam people. And he would begin insisting that he be referred to as Bishop Gary Heidnick. He effectively ordaining, I mean, himself. And he would add to his, to his following, to his congregation, by befriending people with various mental ailments, some, some of whom he had met while he had been institutionalized. And he would persuade them to donate money to his church. Like he was scamming people who already had mental difficulties at this time. So he, he was a predator. Uh, he, know, he knew who he was going after. Later, in 1975, Gary opened an account under the name of the church at a bank with a deposit of $1,500. The account would eventually accrue $500,000, which is... 2.7 million uh, US dollars in today's money. He was getting pretty rich off his little scam. Now 1976. Now that would bring about Gary's first serious legal charges when he was arrested after a shooting incident with a tenant of a house he had been renting out. Though he was charged with aggravated assault and the possession of an unregistered weapon, he wouldn't face any prison time until two years later when he committed a crime that, uh, in hindsight, really should have been an obvious warning of what was to come. Now let's get into that. See, Gary, throughout his life, he'd, had a, he'd always had a fondness for young black women, young African-American women. That was like his, that was his type. And he'd, you know, over time, managed to develop some pretty unhealthy relationships with a few of these women. And at some point, Gary realized that the same technique he used to, well, scam people into joining his church and giving him money, they could also be used to give some other things he wanted. After a brief relationship with a girl named Gail Linkow, uh, a relationship that actually resulted in Gail giving birth to a baby, and a baby that was taken into custody after the state deemed she was mentally incapable of caring for the child, Gary then managed to establish himself in a relationship with a woman named Anjanette Davidson, a woman he had met at one of the various hospitals he worked at. And now, Anjanette, she had a IQ of 48, which was 100 points lower than Gary. But little did Anjanette know that Gary Heidnick was using her to get closer to her younger sister, who was a patient of the Penn Township Mental Institution. He was, he was using Anjanette to get to her little sister. 
wow, oh no, man, guys, if you think this guy's like, wow, what a piece of shit, which I'm sure you're probably thinking, it's gonna get worse, promise you it'll get worse. Gary was, now, now, so Gary was using Anjanette, and during that time, she herself became pregnant during the relationship. She would give birth to a little girl named Maxine, but same as with Gail, she'd be taken away and put into foster care when Anjanette was deemed to be unfit to look after her. But then Gary, he had had enough of Anjanette, and remember, as I said, he was going after Anjanette's little sister. Her name was Alberta. So, in what was pretty much a dry run of his future crimes, Gary was able to sign out Alberta on day leave from the uh, hospital she was at. And then when she didn't return uh, that night, the, the staff became worried, alerted the authorities, and they tracked the young girl down to a three-story home Gary had bought back in 1967. She was found in there, She was found distressed. She was found in a locked storage room in the basement of Gary's house. When Alberta returned to the hospital, an examination revealed she had been raped and sexually assaulted, and she'd also contracted gonorrhea. Guys, this story is not going to get any better. Now, aged 35, Gary was arrested and charged with kidnapping, rape, unlawful restrainment, false imprisonment, involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, and interfering with the custody of a committed person. Gary, he was convicted, and though he was initially sentenced to prison time, he was able to have his sentence overturned and would spend four years in mental institutions instead of prisons, and was finally released in 1983. Now, at some point during his incarceration, Anjanette, remember the older sister, she disappeared. People have speculated that was he involved with her disappearance. Um, Now, he would have been institutionalized, but maybe he would have been able to get out on day release. Who really knows what happened to her and if Gary Heidnick was involved. The year after he was released, in 1984, Gary bought the property at 3520 North Marshall Street. He would go on to make that place infamous as the site of one of the worst crimes of the 1980s, folks, so, um, you know, rub your hands in anticipation for that one. But for the time being, he was just, hey, you know, he's been away for a couple of years, gotta rake in that shed of cheese, you know what I'm saying? He, he began going back to his little cult, religion, bullshit, scam, really, scam with a, with a halo, I don't know what you call it. So Gary now had his little house in a run-down part of North Philadelphia City. And this is where, in 1986, he would unhinge completely. Gary decided to try a mail-order bridal service. This can only end well. Apparently, the only request Gary made of the service was that he wanted a, quote, an oriental virgin. Through the service, he was put in touch with a Filipino woman named Betty Disto. What Betty knew about Gary was only what she'd read in the letters he had written to her, including that he was a he was a minister, and it was a perfect way for him to ingratiate his way into her life, and in the end, he was able to persuade her to move to America and to marry him. Now, as you can imagine, the illusion he had painted of an easy life and promises of everything she could ever want, you know, everything he'd written in the in the letters he'd sent to her, that was like Take a hammer to glass because it was shattered almost immediately after her arrival in Philadelphia. Gary being his scruffy, kind of piece of shit self, now he picked her up in his fancy car and then he took her back to his rundown house in a pretty dicey neighborhood. Betty was concerned about this, as you can imagine, uh, not exactly the picture he had painted in the letters, but you know, she herself was coming from poverty, so she wasn't too shaken up by the whole thing. Not quite yet. And for the first week or so, you know, things, they were, they were pretty good. Gary, he made all the promises in the world. He talked, you know, about being a provider and starting a family. Then, one day, while she returned from a shopping trip, Betty found another woman in bed with Gary. And Gary made it abundantly clear to Betty that he, hey, I mean, I'll give you everything you want, wink, wink, but, uh, I'm gonna see other women, even after we're married. Betty was uh, perturbed, I guess you could say. She was confused, alone, and desperate after this. 
And, uh, you know, her reaction was, was, her reaction to this was like, well, this isn't what I fucking signed up for. He, she demanded he send her back to the Philippines. But Gary became aggressive and he told her he was in charge and she ain't going nowhere. In fear and confusion, you know, she, as you can imagine, she did not know what to do, whether to return to the poverty she'd come from or to give her new circumstances a chance. You know, she, I mean, she was already looking for a way out, but at the end, Betty resolved to go through the wedding, and shortly after, the unhappy couple went and got married. Oh, <laughs> very quickly and steeply, it all went downhill from there. Gary became increasingly abusive with every passing day to his new wife. What had started as neglect became, like, she probably would have wished it had been neglect because he became verbally abusive and then physically abusive. And he was also, as I said the whole time, bringing home various sex workers, random women, He'd met, you know, sex workers he'd met in the street, and a lot, as, as you know, what his type was, which was young African American women who were institutionalized. He would also bring them back too, all the time. Uh, I need a new name for this guy because he really does just suck so so bad. Gary, hmm, Gary Heidnick. How about how about Gary Heidnick? Yeah, yeah, Gary Heidnick. Got him. Burn. Hiding his dick. <laughs> Because it's so Daddy. tiny, he doesn't want to see his tiny dick. Daddy. <laughs> there you go, Gary hiding dick. One afternoon, after she returned home to find Gary in bed with yet another woman, Betty finally snapped, and she told Gary she was sick of it, couldn't live this way. She wanted out. What do you think Gary uh, had to say to that? Well, he let his fists do the talking. After the attack and Gary's spiraling violent behavior, Betty had had enough and she knew she needed to get as far away from Gary as she could. Gary hide Nick. In fear for her life, she secretly managed to form a plan to leave. One afternoon, Betty told Gary she was going shopping. Unknown to Gary, she managed to hide her passport and some clothes in a bag in some bushes outside the house and Betty never looked back. With the help of the local Filipino immigrant community, she managed to, to resettle and, and start over, and little did she know how lucky her timing had been. At the time of her fleeing, Betty was pregnant and gave birth to a son shortly afterwards. Now, obviously, she didn't want Gary to have anything to do with the child, and she would never let Gary meet his son. After Betty had left him, Gary was charged with assault, indecent assault, spousal rape, and involuntary deviant sexual intercourse. Sadly, the charges were dismissed, though, for, well, the obvious reasons. Betty was not gonna, did not want to see, she was terrified of Gary. She, she didn't appear at the preliminary hearing. So, Gary was left to be a free man. But now, Gary was even worse, because he had a huge chip on his shoulder, and he saw him as someone who, you know, he's the real victim here. You know, he lost his wife, he's been maligned in the courts, and now he had to replace her. This is when Gary, you know, I've kind of been saying he's getting worse and getting worse, but now, like, before it was like a slow, you know, decline. Now it's off the cliff. The crimes that would earn Gary Heidendick, the title of Philly's Ted Bundy, began on November 26th, 1986. 25-year-old sex worker and single mother, Josefina Rivera, had stormed out of the North Philly house she shared with her boyfriend after they had an argument. She was walking down the street in a huff in the Philadelphian winter, it was cold, it was wet. And then as she was wandering down, she noticed a silver and black Cadillac Coupe de Ville slow down as it passed by. Then the driver pulled over, just ahead of her, wound the window down. According to Josefina, the, this bearded driver asked if she was you okay and if she needed a ride. Wink, wink. That was Gary Heidendick. And she agreed she would go with them and provide her services in exchange for $20. Now, Josefina thought this guy looked a bit scruffy, but he seemed harmless enough. Harmless? In Philadelphia? This man introduced himself as Gary, and he told her he needed to make a stop, and maybe she might want to go, Josephina might want to go grab a coffee. She didn't see, see any harm in it, she said yeah. The two of them, they drove to a McDonald's, and while he drank his coffee, she got her first chance to properly look at her companion. He was scruffy, he was in cheap clothes that were, you know, had dirt on them, they were stained, 
but she did notice that he wore a very nice and very expensive watch. Now, the this like dichotomy in his appearance of looking kind of like shit, but also having very expensive things should have kind of rang, rang some alarm bells. But then after they finished the coffee, he invited her to go to his house with him and Josephine agreed. Now, outside Gary's Marshall Street house, which, you know, as I said, it's in a North Philly, fairly dodgy, run-down neighborhood, Gary had another, he Gary had two cars, two cars. There was a 1971 Rolls Royce, ladies and gents, which again was another, like, he's living in this shitty house, he's wearing shitty clothes, but he has a very expensive car, he has two cars, and he also has a very expensive watch on, like, this is not adding up here. But Josephina didn't see the warning signs. She didn't see the warning signs even when Gary took out half a house key to let them inside. Josephina asked him, like, why have you only got half a key? He replied that the key had been broken in half, and so he left one piece of the key in the lock at all times. That way, he knew he was the only one who could open the lock, because he had created essentially a new key. Somebody can't, you can't lock pick this lock because there's already something inside it. Once inside, the door opened into the kitchen, where Josephina was immediately struck by the strangeness of what she saw. There were pennies, one and five dollar bills glued to the walls and the doors of the house. Despite seeing this is like, this is getting weirder, weird as shit, she followed him up to the bedroom. Gary, he paid her 20 bucks. They had sex. And everything seemed to be going just as she expected until Gary got up. He got dressed. Josephina, she did the same. And then she suddenly felt Gary grab her from the back, his hands around her throat, choking her. As she was slipping out of consciousness, Gary let go and she was dropped to the floor. Only semi-awake, Josephina felt the cold metal of handcuffs snap closed around her wrists. And she slowly came back as Gary began dragging her down the stairs to the basement. Now, in, in something like straight out of a fucking nightmare, once in the dank cellar, she was dragged across the room over a large plywood board to an old stained mattress in the corner of the room. He shoved her onto the mattress. He went over, he grabbed a large box, out of which he took a large pair of automotive clamps that he then fastened around Josephina's ankles and secured them to a large chain, which he threw over a pipe on the ceiling. He then to, I guess, to make sure she was not going anywhere, he poured glue, fucking glue, over the fastenings of each of her restraints. She was trapped, Josephina, poor woman, she was trapped, she was terrified, and she, there was no way she could get out of this. In his fucking Joseph Fritzl style basement. Josephina then watched helplessly as Gary moved the large piece of plywood in the middle of the room revealing that he'd broken through the concrete floor. The basement floor, you know, that would be poured concrete, he'd broken through it and dug it a large hole, a big old hole in the middle of the basement. Gary then, like this is textbook. You, you know when you see serial killers and insane people out of horror movies, it's based on this kind of shit because he began to talk to himself as he shoveled scoops of dirt from the bottom of the pit. Then, he told her he wanted to have children. Lots of children. He told her about the things that had happened to his other children. That Betty, she had ran away and she was never going to let him see his kids because he's uh, a fucking psycho. The other two kids he had, they were taken away by the state as, you know, they were his, the mothers were deemed incapable of looking after him. And so he, Gary was like, this is unfair, this is unfair, I'm going crazy, man, they're taking all my kids, they're taking all my kids, man. I, I, I'm owed a family, I'm owed a family and you're going to give me the family? And we're gonna have lots and lots of babies. He even told he even told her he wanted to get ten women in the basement and have them all bear children. Like this was this was a farm. Like he would have them hooked up like cows in a goddamn barn, and they would all just like a, a little factory here pumping out kids from. This is some sick shit. Eventually, Gary left her alone in the cold, damp basement. Josephina tried to break any of these chains, but no, they were all too strong. But she did manage to get to a small window, which she was able to force open with an old broken pool cue she found on the floor. 
She managed to squeeze her way halfway out of the window before the chain, you know, wouldn't let her go any, any further. And she began then screaming, hoping that someone would hear and come investigate. But Gary, he had... This is when Gary's shit, you start to see crazy like a fox. That's why he picked this house in this kind of shitty neighborhood. Because screams were a regular occurrence. No one came to her rescue. The only person who came was Gary. He ran down, he dragged Josephina, who was still screaming, back through the tiny window and then bet the living shite out of her. He then pulled her across the concrete and dropped her body into the pit and dragged the plywood sheet back over the hole and placed bags filled with dirt on top of the wooden sheet. She, Josephina, she could barely move. She was curled up with her knees all the way to her chest. She was struggling to breathe. She was, she felt like she was going to suffocate. And then Gary turned on the radio and turned up the volume as loud as it was go. She could barely breathe. She was in complete dark in this tiny hole and the radio was so loud it would, you couldn't hear a thing. And Gary was already working on how to give her some company. He had been working on grooming 24-year-old Sandra Lindsay for some time, even before he came across Josephina. He'd met Sandra at one of the institutes he worked at and where he'd been essentially trying to prey on the patients. Again, she was a young black woman who had learning difficulties. Sandra was one of the people who was attending Gary's little church after meeting him at the institute. And so, you know, she felt comfortable. She trusted him. And he'd taken that trust and her belief in him and used it to have sex with her on several occasions. She'd even become pregnant as a result of one of these encounters, but had terminated the baby. And Gary was not too keen on that, he'd even offered her, hey, you know, I'll give you a thousand bucks if you let me, um, you know, get you pregnant again. She said no. And then Gary decided, well, how about I don't ask anymore? On the 29th of November, 1986, just two days after he'd kidnapped Josephina, Gary followed Sandra as she shopped for groceries and pretended he just, hey, that's crazy seeing you here, right? He then managed to persuade her to go home with him. Once inside, as he had done with Josephina, he dragged her down to the basement where she was still curled up in the pit. He pulled her out, began to shovel dirt out of the pit, essentially trying to make the pit bigger, and then he assaulted them both, put them back in the pit. The next morning, two of Sandra's cousins appeared at Gary's front door looking for her. Gary, he didn't answer the door, he hid, and eventually these cousins, they gave up and they went away. And soon they were back, back this time with the police in tow. So Gary, what he did this time was, um, he came up with a plan of how he could get these people off his trail. He went down to the basement with a pen and paper, and he had Sandra write out a note to her mother. The short letter, it read, Dear Mom, do not worry, I will call, followed by her signature underneath. He then took the note he drove all the way to New York City, which is about an hour and a half away, and he posted the letter back to Philadelphia. Sandra's mother, she received the letter about a day later. Didn't, you know, she thought the letter was, was bullshit. She, she knew her daughter didn't believe she would ever run away or leave of her own volition. She reported her daughter missing and even insisted that the police stay look into Gary. But she didn't know Gary's second name, though... So the police couldn't match this Gary with Gary Heidendick, who had a lengthy record already. And the police, they thought, well, yeah, yeah, right, you're Sandra's mother and all, but listen, we, I think we, who have never met Sandra, we probably know her better, and sounds like she ran away, you know? Sorry. So basically, the police did not do jack shit, and weeks would pass by with Josephina and Sandra in a hole in Gary Heidendick's basement. The beatings and the assaults were daily. Gary, he had even begun to soundproof the basement. Not that they would have even dared scream how just terrified they were. He would give them scraps of food. Uh, they weren't allowed to bathe or wash themselves. Nothing. They were just kept in his basement. A lot of times he would take them out of the pit. 
if they were being good, but as soon as they were, well, not being good, back in the pit. In December, nearing Christmas of 1986, Gary decided it was, well, hey, listen, time to, time for, to get another one, right? Need, need to expand my collection. So that afternoon, Gary went out cruising the streets in his Cadillac looking for his next victim, and he set his sights on a 19-year-old woman named Lisa Thomas. Lisa fit the profile of Gary's other victims perfectly and was drawn in by his expensive car. And he said, hey, listen, you know, pop in. We can chat to sh shoot to shit and I'll drive you to wherever you need to go. Lisa said, sure. She got in. The two talked. Gary drove. He reportedly was a very charming guy and he, he won her over and he invited, he even invited her to Atlantic City with him. When she told him she, she couldn't go, she didn't have any fancy clothes, Gary said, hey, listen, well, you know, how about I take you shopping? And she said, hell yeah. The two, they drove to a, to a shopping store. Uh, he gave her 50 bucks, enough to buy a few outfits. And now she was like, kind of head over heels with Gary. She would have done anything. She was you know, blown away by him. And so he said, well, hey, how about you come back to my place? And Lisa, being poor, young and naive, she said yes. Once back at the Marshall Street house, Gary continued the polite act, even pouring Lisa a glass of wine. Then, after she drank it, Lisa fell into a state of semi-consciousness. Gary had drugged the wine. He then immediately took advantage of her, took her to a bedroom, raped her. Now, Lisa was barely conscious. She asked if she, he could take her to a friend's house. Gary said, uh, absolutely no. He choked her till she fell unconscious. He then snapped a pair of handcuffs around her wrists. She was taken down to the basement too, where he introduced her to the other prisoners. Then, on New Year's Day 1987, he went after another woman, 23-year-old Deborah Johnson Dudley. He got her back to his house using the same, he's, now he had a routine. He was doing the same things over and over again, and he had four women in his basement, chained up that he would assault and beat every day. Victim number five would follow less than two weeks later, pretty much identical to his first kip kidnapping of, of Josephina. Josephina, by the way, she had now been in his basement for six weeks. Gary met 18-year-old sex worker named Jacqueline Askins, and he invited her back to his place. And she agreed. She accompanied him home. Once inside, he distracted her with his collection of old arcade games and said, hey, do you want to play some, some games? When she was playing away on this arcade game, he stuck her behind her, he choked her with a headlock, dragged her by the neck down the stairs into the basement where he chained her up with the four other women. Now he is five. Now, I, I think you can probably imagine I don't really need to go into much detail about what those women experienced on a regular basis at the hands of Gary Heidendick. But, uh, you know, in addition to the beatings, assaults, sexual assaults, and other, the various physical and psychological tortures he would inflict upon them, he also ran his, uh, his own little Stanford prison experiment by forcing the women to beat each other up and rewarding them for telling on each other. Like the last thing he wanted to, to, to happen, because like in all, he was a smart guy. The last thing he wanted them to do was to team up, you know, to, to, to try and attack him, overpower him, do something to plan. He wanted them to hate each other. To, to have no bonds or no support for each other, to sow the seeds of distrust and jealousy amongst them. Over time, Josephina, who was his first victim, she kind of became recognized as his favorite amongst the group, and she realized early on that obedience is how you are going to survive this. Just you know, stay alive, and there will be an opportunity to escape at one point. Now, Gary would give the women occasional treats, like, like uh, Chinese takeout food, ice cream, but he would always make sure to exclude at least one person or two people to try and form jealousy and resentment uh, among, amongst the group. The thing he loved most, the thing he even loved more than his little plan to have a baby farm, was the control he had over these women. That was what really like got him off, I think, at this point. In February, Gary's second victim, 24-year-old Sandra Lindsay, she became very ill after by this stage, two months in captivity. She was vomiting, she was running an intense fever. Gary, now he hoped these signs of an obvious illness, which were most likely caused by the very unsanitary conditions they'd been forced to live in, he was thinking, oh man, 
Maybe she's like having morning sickness. Maybe she's pregnant. Uh, but, well, Sandra soon, she was unable to eat. And, well, see, again, Gary was thinking she was pregnant, so he would start force feeding her. But she couldn't because she wasn't pregnant. It was because of living in these conditions. Then he decided to chain her up by one wrist from the ceiling. She was hanging from the ceiling by one of her wrists for two whole days. Eventually, due to this, she asphyxiated. She couldn't support her own body weight after that long. Gary, he found her dead, did not give a shit. The remaining women watched helplessly as Gary forced Josephina to help him carry Sandra's body upstairs. Once she rejoined the others downstairs, they were, well, they heard the unmistakable sound of an electric saw, and they knew, well, right away what he was doing. Gary used the saw to dismember Sandra's body. He then ground up various parts of the body he could fit into his kitchen meat grinder and fed the meat to his dogs. He then took the remaining parts, incinerated them in his oven, all except for, for the skull, which he took and he boiled in a pot on the stove. That smell filled the house and the surviving captives knew what had happened to Sandra. Now Gary's neighbors, they heard strange noises coming from his house, but they never really knew what was going on. And they witnessed a lot of sex workers and young women coming and going at all hours, but they had just written him off as just a, a weirdo. Um, but when strange smells started coming out, that's when they began to think, huh. This is, there's something more here than, you know, just some horny old fucker. Now Gary, he would say, hey, I'm just, just burning a roast dinner. You know yourself, right? As these things happen, it's definitely not human flesh, I swear. Even when the police called to his house, he just said, sorry guys, but the smell, just burn some dinner. Don't worry about it. And the police said, okay, yeah, sounds about right. All right, hey, good luck, good luck next time. It was during this time after the police had called, Gary feeling like he was, you know, sh time was running out, that shit was hitting the fan. Well, Deborah, one of the girls he had, she decided now's the time. We better, let's form a plan to escape, to, to get out of here, right? We, let's, let's team up and take him. But Gary's control worked pretty well. Before Deborah could put her plan together, Josephina confessed everything to Gary. Gary was furious about this, about the revelation of a plan to escape and decided on his most severe and brutal punishment yet. Even worse than the pit. Gary, he took a screwdriver. Um, guys, I'm I'm telling this story and even I have a hard time doing that, did, like telling this, so, so just buckle up. Gary took a screwdriver and he pushed it into the ear canals of each of the women, except for Josephina, who was quickly becoming more of a pet to Gary. Gary believed that if each of the women could not hear each other, they'd be unable to plan against them and would become even more compliant. He deafened each of the women, except Josephina. And after Sandra's death, he became even more cruel and inventive in his torture methods, even telling the women he'd put pieces of Sandra's body into their food after they'd eaten it, of course. Now, whether that's true or not, we don't know, but it was, it would, I mean, that would fuck you up enough because they knew what he was doing. By March, Gary had found another form of, uh, of torture that he loved. He would take an extension cord and expose the wires and use it to give the women shocks. On one occasion, on March 18th, the shocks they became, he got bored with them. And so he decided he needed to, to level things up, right? He needed, he, he wasn't doing a firm anymore. So he had Deborah, Lisa and Jacqueline in the pit and he filled the pit with water. He then touched the exposed wires to Deborah's chains. The electricity flowed through the tree-soaked women. Deborah fell limp, face first into the water, and she was dead. Never missing an opportunity for another level of compliance, Gary took the time to then get a pen and some paper, and he forced Josephina to write out a letter confessing to playing a role in Deborah's death. He said that if she ever, you know, went to the police, talked about what had happened. He would just show the letter to the police and he, you're going down with me. He even made the others sign the bottom of the letter as witnesses. 
He was so convinced he had Josephina under his total control that he even allowed her to get dressed for the first time in months. I mean, by this stage, it's like, what, five months now? He released her from the chains. He allowed her to move around the house. He began to treat Josephina more like a girlfriend, not a prisoner he'd been holding in his basement. He wrapped Deborah, you know, Deborah who died from electric shock, wrapped her body in bed sheets, had Josephina help him move the body upstairs and out to his car. He then drove her and Deborah's body out to the Pine Barrens in Jersey, where he buried Deborah's body. He, like, at this point, Josephina was his accomplice, or he was convinced she was his accomplice anyway. On the drive home, Gary told Josephina of his plans to add to his little groupies he had. He wanted to get 10 women in the basement. The next day, Gary decided he needed to replace Deborah, and so he arranged a date with a sex worker he had seen previously. He offered 24-year-old Agnes Adams 30 bucks to have sex with him. Once she got to the house, you know what he did. He strangled her, dragged her down to the basement, put her in, well, Deborah's empty chains, and, well, she was another one he kept. And now after this, after he'd gotten a new woman, Josephina saw, hey, Gary, you look like you're in a pretty good mood. You know, she decided now was the time to to chance, to chance around and ask Gary if she could visit her family for a few hours. Remember, at this point, Gary, he had such, con he believed he had such control over her. He began to think of her as his girlfriend, as his partner in crime. So Gary said, yeah, you're not going to betray me, right? At this point, you know, I trust you. So, um, I, I remember he had her with a letter saying she was an accomplice, so she's not going to do it. So he said, yeah, sure. You know, go, go, uh, have a few hours to see your family and then come right back to the basement, all right? Chains will be here waiting for you. Now, Josephina had planned this for months. On the evening of March 27, 1987, Gary dropped Josephine off just outside her old neighborhood after instructing her to meet him in a few hours at a gas station parking lot. As soon as Gary was out of sight, she sprinted. After months in Gary's custody, she was finally free and she ran like hell all the way back to her old apartment where she shouted, hammered on the door. When her boyfriend, Vincent, answered who she hadn't seen in months, she told him everything that had happened to her, everything that had happened since she had stormed out after an argument. Now, Vincent's immediate reaction was to grab a gun and go see Mr. Heidendick. But Josephina, she was worried, like he has, I mean, he has hostages at this point. So she stopped him and instead they went and they called 911. And she told everything to the responding officers, showing them the scars and the marks he had left on her. As you can imagine, police were horrified by this. A whole bunch of squad cars were going to meet Gary at the gas station where Josephina had arranged to meet with him. Gary arrived and he saw guns drawn. He got out of his car and seemed completely unfazed by the police being there. He even asked if this was something to do with his wife and child support payments. He believed the police were arresting him where he had agreed to meet Josephina. He believed, he, like, the thought of Josephina betraying him never entered his brain. The police said, It's a little bit more serious than unpaid child support payments, buddy. It was four hours before the officers got to the Marshall Street house. And some of the arresting officers, you know, even though they'd heard the story from Josephina, nothing could prepare them for what they would find inside the house. At 5 a.m., squad cars and officers surrounded the house. They smashed in the door. In addition to the four women chained up in the basement, officers discovered bags of human flesh in the freezer, which were labeled dog food. Elsewhere in the kitchen, they discovered human bones in pots and pans on the stove. On the shelf in the fridge was a human arm, and the heat in the house was stifling. So you got a sweaty damn house with the stench of death in the air. The women downstairs, they were initially scared of the police not realizing what was, what was going on. One of the women pointed to the pit in the middle of the floor, and when the officers pulled back the dirt and the boards, they found Agnes was down in the pit. She'd been kept down there. All in all, they found the four women along with 24 pounds of human flesh. That was Sandra Lindsay in Gary's fridge freezer. 
While at the police, they poured over every detail of Gary's life, including searching his former properties around, around the city. Gary was swiftly transferred to the prison's psychiatric wing after he was attacked by another prisoner. And shortly after this move, guards found him hanging by a noose made from his shirt in the bathroom in his latest attempt at taking his own life. By the way, he wasn't successful. He was still alive. His conditions were then tightened and he was put on a high dose of antipsychotics. Gary was put on trial for capital murder. Normally, it would be an open and shut case with, you know, the surviving victims. You had first-hand eyewitnesses who would testify. But one of the things with Gary's history of mental illness was, you know, innocent by reason of insanity, essentially. And Gary, he had money. He could afford good lawyers. And the lawyers, they instructed him, okay, Gary, you know, plead guilty, but due to diminished capacity because of, you know, your mental health problems. That's what his defense attorneys did. They lent on his, his history of mental illness, his history of, you know, institutional, being, an inst being institutionalized, all that kind of thing. They tried to paint Josephina as his accomplice, you know, that she had helped him in doing this, that she wasn't, you know, a victim at all here. In July of 1988, the jury returned with a guilty verdict. Gary M. Hyden Dick was found guilty of the multiple charges of kidnapping, rape, and first-degree murder. And the first-degree murder conviction would earn him the death penalty, something Gary was actually happy with. And shortly after his conviction, Gary was found in a coma, having hoarded and overdosed on his medication. But, but somehow he survived and recovered. He was, he was very good at killing other people, really bad at killing himself. And that's when Gary realized, hey, listen, okay, if I can't kill myself, I'll get you, you guys to do it. He filed a motion with the court to have his execution expedited. He was still trying to control everything around him. I mean, I guess, you know, when he was growing up a kid, his parents were so horrific and abusive, he felt, you know, they controlled him. He had no control over his life. He was then, you know, in the army where, you know, they control you. Now, he just demanded control over everything else. It took eight years of automatic appeals for Gary to have a date scheduled for his execution, and that was set for April 1997. But it was delayed again when his 19-year-old daughter, who he never met by this, by this point, by the way, appealed on his behalf, stating, you know, that he was not competent to be executed. But the execution, you know, it was upheld. The sentence of death was upheld. Gary was executed on the 6th of July, 1999, at the State Correctional Institution at Rockview in Bellefont. As of 2022, he was the last person to be executed by the state. And that, my friends, is the story of that one. I think when I combine all the stories I've told, you know, on the podcast uh, thus far, and all the stories I've told on the That Chapter YouTube channel, I think this... This ranks up there as probably the worst, definitely the most sadistic that I've ever come across. Like, body count wise, it's pretty low, but I mean, sadistic, cruel, very, very, very high. Like, he's a scary bastard. You, He was found to have an IQ of 148, which meant he was very intelligent and very good at thinking logically. Like, he's an evil genius. So he was able to think true logically think through everything he did. The only, he only failed when he trusted somebody he shouldn't have trusted, but then he, he did probably didn't have very good social skills because he grew up in his own little world the whole time. It's insane. And these poor women that he kept, I mean, the two had died, and all other women who kept, who he would abuse and torture every day. He deafened some of them with screwdrivers. I mean, poor Josephine, it's incredibly tragic case, and it's an amazing woman for surviving all of this. But yeah, well, the world is definitely a better place without this piece of shit. But we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for listening, folks. I really, really appreciate you taking the time to be here with me. I hope you found this as disturbing as I did. And I will talk to you real soon in the next old podcast. But until then, uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind writing, rating and reviewing the podcast, that helps out so, so much. But yeah, thanks again. And as always, please take care of each other and yourselves because I love you. Mike out.